Hi, everyone. Welcome to uh, Traverse Area Historical Society. We have been doing monthly Zoom programs um, during our, our last year of COVID. And for this program, we're going to talk about our tours that are coming up because the summer is opening up and we'll be doing outside tours again. I am Jennifer Loop. I am the Secretary and Events and Program Chair. And we will have some of our tour guides talk about today. Well, it has some recorded videos. We did record some of our tours over the past year. Uh, those are available on YouTube. We'll let you know where the, all of those are. And we'll kind of go back and forth with some of the tour stops, with the Oakwood Cemetery tour and the downtown tour. And then we'll do question and answer because these people have a wealth of knowledge on local history. And so if you have questions, you can put them in the chat. But we'll also be able to get people if their hands are raised and, and we'll figure all that out. Um, so we offer two different tours during the summer season. One is a downtown tour where we have about 20, 25 stops. We talk about the history of some of the buildings. We look at the buildings as they are now. Um, some of the big players in the uh, history of Traverse City. And then for our Oakwood Cemetery tour, that's about an hour and a half. Um, very similar. We, um, the tour guide stop at a few of the nodal graves, weave that into the history of the area, but talk about a lot of the people that have been involved in Traverse City history. So, um, yeah, write down your questions. We'll be able to answer quite a lot of them. Um, we're first going to start with a video from the recorded Oakwood Cemetery tours. And as long as I can get my tech right, we'll be able to go. We are here in Oakwood Cemetery. I uh, at the mausoleum of Julius T. Hanna, his Elsie Raff Hanna, and her family. Julius, you may recognize his last name, Hannah, as he is the son of Perry Hannah, well known as the father of Traverse City. Most of us don't know as much about Julius, and there is a good reason for that. Julius was born in 1858 and died in 1905, just one year after his famous father passed away. Think about that. Think of celebrities today. And how often, you know, we hear stories of the difficulties that their offspring have, finding a place for themselves in the shadow of their famous parents. Well, think of Julius. He grew up in his father's shadow. Now, we have no reason to think that their relationship wasn't a fine relationship and that he wasn't sad when his father passed away. However, it would have given him a chance to move into the leadership of the company. He had started working in the company at the bottom rungs, worked his way up, as far as we can tell, was very successful, and then he passed away. Well, as far as... You want to try one of those? Uh, Is this muting me? Um, I'm thinking Jen might have had to go out and come back in or something. Because I don't see her on here now. So we'll give her just a second to, we'll give her just a second to figure it out. Oh. 
And she did run the video partway through before we started, but not all the way through. So I'm not sure what happened. It looked like she was asleep to me. <laughs> <laughs> she went to stretch and then she froze. So maybe, maybe her, uh, it kicked off or something. So we'll give her just a second to come back on. Because I think she's the only one who has the video, right, Peg? I could pull it up and I will work on that in case she has disappeared. Okay. But it'll take me a minute. Okay. Very against your smile face. Beautiful monuments in the lower center. part. And died in 1905, just one year after his famous father passed away. Think about that. Think of celebrity. Okay. Um, Betsy, can you yes. hear me? Okay. Um, this is a slightly different setup. I'm used to Google Meet. Uh, where is the present button under more probably? Nope, that's um, breakout rooms. There's share screen that's in the middle. Ah, there we go. Thank, Thank you. you. You're welcome. This is... Okay, this is what happened. I have to switch computers. So if everybody can just, actually, I could tell you all the information. You just wouldn't be able to see anything but my face, which isn't all that interested. So give me just a minute. All you people who so nicely stayed inside during this wonderful weather. So yeah, Jen just said that um, her computer just melted. Okay. And that's pretty um, much all she said. So I told her you were trying to pull it up. I'm on my other computer. Okay, Betsy? Yes. You can hear me? Yes. Okay. I am now going to open another window, at which point... So Jen said something about her taste. Uh, a very popular Oakwood Cemetery tour with a Halloween twist. Because of the COVID pandemic, we will not be offering these tours this year, but we certainly hope to see you next year. What? Oh, uh, can you hear me, Betsy? Yes. Okay, you need to enable me again because I'm in a different. Oh, a different computer? Yeah. <clears throat> okay, let me.
Okay, there you go. Okay. There you go. Can you see it, people? Yep. Yep. Okay. Now, if I can just get to it and start it running. We are here in Oakwood Cemetery, uh, right at the mausoleum of Julius T. Hanna, his wife, Elsie Raff Hanna, and her family. Julius, you may recognize his last name, Hanna, as he is the son of Perry Hanna, well known as the father of Traverse City. Most of us don't know as much about Julius, and there is a good reason for that. Julius was born in 1858 and died in 1905, just one year after his famous father passed away. Think about that. Think of celebrities today and how often, you know, we hear stories of the difficulties that their offspring have, finding a place for themselves in the shadow of their famous parents. Well, think of Julius. He grew up in his father's shadow. Now, we have no reason to think that their relationship wasn't a fine relationship and that he wasn't sad when his father passed away. However, it would have given him a chance to move into the leadership of the company. He had started working in the company at the bottom rungs, worked his way up, as far as we can tell, was very successful, and then he passed away. While, as far as we know, Julius's relationship with his father for most of his life was a good one, we do have reason to believe that closer to the end of it, there were some problems. Elsie Raff lived right across the street uh, to the east of the Perry Hanna mansion. And there are reasons to believe that the Hannas were not super thrilled with Julius marrying Elsie. Her father was quite successful in comparison to pretty much anyone else, other than perhaps Perry Hanna. And we, there are, again, stories somewhat substantiated that Elsie was not welcome in the Hanna house, even after the marriage. Now, perhaps a proof of that or something that would make us think that could be true is the fact that the Perry Hanna family plant, plot is on the southwest corner of Oakwood Cemetery. The mausoleum here of Julius is more on the where are we, northeast corner, not quite as far apart as it could possibly be, but close to it. So that does sort of lead to the possibility that there was some tension there towards the end of Perry Hanna's life. Uh, <clears throat> speaking of houses and the fact that the Rath and the Hanna house were right across the street from each other. This does bring up another Halloween with a twist story that we're offering in these uh, videos that we're giving, whether you watch them at Halloween or not. And it brings up a house I had a personal experience with in the Boardman neighborhood. There's a uh, relatively new uh, cottage type house sitting on a corner in that neighborhood. I always thought it was very beautiful. When I first moved to town in the mid 1980s, it was an empty lot. At some point, this house was built. It was an aesthetic architecture that I really liked, so I paid a lot of attention to it. And it seemed to be turning over. Every two or three years, there'd be a for sale sign and someone else would buy it. And then two or three years later, it would be back up for sale again. Seemed odd to me because the location was gorgeous. The house was beautiful. And then when I was working as the archivist, one evening, a couple came in and they started asking me about information I might have on a house in Boardman neighborhood. And it turned out it was the same house that I had noticed over the years. As we talked further, they eventually got comfortable with me and they revealed that they were thinking of purchasing it because they had heard it was haunted. And they were the kind of couple that that was actually something that was attractive to them. They wanted to move into a haunted house. So I started doing some research, trying to figure out if there was any you know, substance to this. And I looked back through the newspapers and the records and I found out that what had sat on that lot before it was torn down was a grocery store. And it had apartments above it. Now, I didn't find anything about the grocery store being haunted. However, when I looked into the tenants 
of the apartments. For several years, there was a man who lived up there, and his name was Fred Deadman. Deadman. No story of any hauntings or, uh, you know, untoward doings going on up there, but I must admit the name Dead Man did catch my attention given the uh, questions that were being asked. Okay, can people hear me now? Yeah, okay, my screen is, oh, Jenny is back. Jenny can, um, <laughs> if anyone has any questions about um, Perry Hanna or uh, his son, that whole uh, involvement with the Raft family, et cetera, or the burials in Oakwood, either Larry Haynes or I could answer. So Jenny, do you wanna, how do you want people to ask if they have something to add or say? Um, there is a question in the chat. Thanks for handling that. On my end, my computer froze and would not turn off. It like melted down. It was saying the same thing for like two minutes. So you're lucky you didn't hear it. Um, someone asked, where is that house located? And then I'm going to look for hands raised. <laughs> yeah. I, I sort of hate to give you an exact address because, um, you know, I hate, well, to have, I actually, I don't have an exact address, but uh, it's on the northeast corner, I think of Washington, and I honestly do not remember the, the, the north-south street that it's on. I'd have to look at a map, but it's a pink house. It looks like sort of like a cottage. It's a cottage, like a small Victorian style cottage. And honestly, um, I ride my bike around there all the time and it has not turned hands for a long time. So for all I know, there was something wrong with the plumbing. It's just, I, I remember just thinking, I just kept noticing it turn over and over because we were sort of looking for a house at the time. And I was like, well, I don't know, you know, it's a little further away than we want to be from the college where my husband works. But um, it has been, as far, unless it's changed hands without any sign going up, it's been in the same family for at least a decade now. Peg? Yeah. Yeah, that would be the northeast corner of uh, Rose and uh, Washington. Okay, Rose and Washington. And, uh, for what it's worth, that house is no longer there. The grocery store and apartment above it is torn out. The house that's there was built, I don't know, maybe 20 years ago. Right, right. It, it is a newer home. So right. and if there you know, was anything to haunting situations, it and I, I was the archivist at the Historical Society for like six or seven years, and we would not infrequently have people coming in looking for information about kinds of things like that. So my take on it is I never poo-pooed it. Who knows? You know, I, I don't know. I'm not an expert on it and I would help people out as they went. But if there was any aura of something negative or sad there, it would have come before the building of the home that is currently sitting there. It would be, I think, from the point of view of people who look into these things, it would be the land or the space rather than the actual home. So oh, I, I just real quick, Peg, I put a note in the chat, but my husband's grandfather used to run that store and we do not have any ghost stories left over in the family. So just as right. I yeah. So I don't think, I don't know any ghost stories to add. Right, to. okay, well, that's, I mean, that's, in a way too bad, in a way not. And oh, I just wanted to add also, I mentioned the Halloween with a Twist tour. That is something that the Historical Society gives just at Halloween time. And it just adds a few of the little like ghost-like legends and things. And some of them we tell and we know that they're just a legend, you know, that they've been totally fabricated and made up. Others um, might have some accuracy to them that, you know, people that, are actually on this particular meeting have seen odd things happen. So uh, that's just sort of an extra fun thing that it includes information from our regular summer cemetery tour plus extra. 
Yeah. Um, and thanks for explaining that. I was thinking about that. Um, and we will be doing those again in the fall, I think, our Halloween yes. tours this year. Yep. Um, someone did ask, did the Hannah family have a Quaker connection? I don't know. Do you know, Larry? I do not. Um, while we're waiting for more questions or when, as Jen um, starts the next video, I will check because I have Legends of the Grand Traverse literally at my fingertips. So I'll check that while we are continuing. Harry was born in 1824 in Ohio, I believe, and he's of Scottish descent. Yep. Um, someone also did ask, who would be a good contact person or a source regarding the stone mausoleum um, in Oakwood, which contains burial crypts? I guess I'm not sure which one, this question is from Matthew, um, which one they're referring to. Do you guys know? Um, are you? T I, I wonder if he's talking about the large one on the west side of the cemetery. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would say that calling the cemetery office would be, Larry, do you know off the top of your head, I believe it was, what year was it built in? Uh, yeah, I'll have hand, I'm uh, not uh, recall, uh, 1927 maybe. That's what I was going to say, mid-20s. And I know there are spaces that, I don't know why I know this, I guess, because I've been in and out of there. There are spaces available in there still. And yeah, the large one, I think you would call the main office, Matt. And uh, um, I do know that uh, almost without fail, any regular business day, Monday through Friday, the doors to that, which are on the east side, uh, are open. I mean, totally open. Uh, and you can go in there. There's a little area where one can sit down on a couple of couches or chairs and have a quiet time, I guess, if you want to or whatever. Uh, look around. I believe there's 162 spaces, not all of which are uh, currently occupied. That's great. Um, yep, that's the one, the large one. Uh, Peg, would you mind playing the video from your end, though, because I'm worried that it's going to crash my computer again. Okay, and we're going last, on to Augusta. last Zoom program of the year here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Augusta Rosenthal Thompson, a wonderful story. We are here at the marker of Dr. Augusta Rosenthal Thomas. Her story is one of groundbreaking success, heartbreak, and ultimately heart-touching providence, or perhaps, if you wish to look at it this way, supernatural karma. Dr. Augusta Rosenthal was born in Indiana in 1859. She would become one of the first women to graduate from the University of Michigan School of Medicine and one of the first women in the United States or the world to become a doctor. In the late 1870s or early 1880s, she came to Northern Michigan to Traverse City as the first female physician in this area. In 1889, she had her only child, Jackie, who unfortunately passed away in 1896 at the age of six. So she's had her groundbreaking success and now the heartbreak. She had married another doctor so she and her husband lived on State Street in a, a house that has now been uh, renovated and redone and is in gorgeous shape. However, their marriage did not survive the death of their son, Jackie. Jackie died from diphtheria. And after his death, Dr. Rosenthal Thomas, Augusta, decided to go to Europe because that was where the major research on in pediatric medicine was being done. And she, of course, she and her husband were heartbroken that as, especially as doctors, they hadn't been able to save their son's life. So Dr. Augusta went to Europe, had to fight quite hard to get the training she wanted because women, especially in Europe, still weren't being accepted very well as physicians. She was gone for two years. And when she came back to the United States, her husband sued for divorce based on desertion and they were divorced. But this is where the providence or perhaps the karma of the story comes in. When, Augusta, when Dr. Rosenthal Thompson arrived back in Traverse City, 
there was a couple there to meet her at the station, friends of hers. Their young son was near death, death from diphtheria, the same disease that had killed Augusta's own son. Because of the training she had received in Europe during those two years, she was able to go to their son and save his life. After her return, eventually uh, Dr. Augusta Rosenthal Thomas moved to Grand Rapids where she practiced for many more years and she eventually died at the age of 95 in 1954. Her body was brought back up here to Traverse City, buried next to her son, Jackie, in an unmarked grave. In the late 1990s, early 2000s, the Traverse Area Genealogical Society member, Ginny LeClaire and other members found out about Dr. Augusta Rosenthal Thompson and that her grave was unmarked. They worked on this for several years and eventually the Genealogical Society, the Historical Society and the Zonta Club put together an effort to purchase a marker and put a marker on this grave of this woman who had such a groundbreaking, if heartbreaking, life. Hi, my name is Peg Siciliano. <laughs> okay, that's that. Yeah, so I'm looking for questions in the chat. Peg, did you mention kind of a few of the other things you talk about on the Oakwood tour? Or the other people or players or any of that? Um, have not started yet. Okay. Um, you want me to do that now? Sure. Or Larry, you, Larry, his, his Your computer favorites. tips up. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's hard to see him. Okay. <laughs> um, when we do the Oakwood tour, the regular one, and also the, the Halloween one, we talk a lot about the um, statuary the symbolism of cemeteries, uh, how they developed. We talk about a lot of very uh, interesting characters, uh, in either important or interesting characters from the history of Traverse City. We talk about Wild Bill Germain, who was a gentleman who apparently had a very extroverted personality, somewhat of a temper, but also very charismatic who was the mayor of Traverse City at one point. And uh, we talk about his somewhat checkered uh, life, uh, some real ups and some real downs. We talk about the various veterans areas in the cemetery. There's a Spanish-American War plot. There's a Civil War plot. Um, there's a general military, um, what is the organization, Larry, that does the, the larger monument for the is it Veterans of Foreign War? Uh, I don't, American Legion, uh, BFW. American uh, Legion. Yeah, where the, um, where the monolith is. I anyway, we go to all those places. Uh, we talk about the first person who was born on the shores of West Bay in the middle of a blizzard, actually, was the first person, first white settler ever born, not obviously not Native American, but white settler that was born within what is within now the uh, boundaries of Traverse City. The oldest person born in the cemetery. Um, lots of interesting facts. We do not cover the entire cemetery. So often what will happen is given the age or the cemetery opened in the 18, late 1860s, we tend to cover the earlier people in there. So sometimes we'll have people on the tours that'll be like, well, you know, are we going to go to the area where my grandparents are buried? And often we don't at this point, although we'd love to expand the tour. And I will say, it's just, it's a beautiful tour uh, to give it a plug in the summertime, especially because if you've been just, Oakwood, it's so shady and breezy and I find it pleasant. And it's just a great way to spend an hour and a half or so during the summer. Sometimes it can get rainy and windy during the Halloween tour and cold. <laughs> that adds to the ambiance. Yes, it does. 
Um, Larry, and Larry does a lot of the, the cemetery tours. Do you have anything you'd like to add about maybe your favorite things to talk about or, um, you know, kind of your experience as a tour guide? Uh, nothing uh, really uh, spectacular. I mean, it's an interesting tour. I enjoy uh, every time I give it. Uh, I particularly enjoy uh, when we get people that come along and uh, uh, they have relation you know, that uh, uh, are in there and they can add something to it. Uh, though I tell folks it's supposed to be an hour and a half tour, but uh, and I'm not going to have, answer every question you have. Otherwise, it'll be a three and a half hour tour. Uh, so sometimes we have to skip along and and move along. It does go over some uh, um, not exactly smooth areas. Uh, not all of the quote streets are paved, so they have rocks and they have fallen branch or twigs uh, sometimes. And sometimes we walk across the uh, the, the air burial areas. We don't stay on the street all the time in order to get to places. So people need to be prepared and you know, have walking shoes and and um, be able to traverse that. We have had a couple of people in wheelchairs, uh, and they work okay usually if they are of the larger. Uh, I don't know if it's balloon tires, but they're larger tires as opposed to. Uh, just like a small wheelchair would, that wouldn't do so well. So, um, you know, it takes about an hour and a half and uh, we move right along and, uh, you know, I've had some great uh, tours and some great folks. That's great, good summary. Um, so I also wanna say thank you to board member Jim Warner for putting together these videos uh, with Peg and there's my cat. Um, and there are a few others, and they're available on the Tattle Traverse Area District Library YouTube channel. I'll um, be right back. Someone's knocking at my door. Keep no, going. Don't figure it out. Well, I was going to think about if anyone has any more questions, feel free to put them about the Oakwood tours. Feel free to put them in the chat. We'll do some at the end. Um, I am also going to try to share a few slides. Hopefully, my computer's working now. Uh, but also with Larry and Peg's help, um, because they're the ones, I do some of the downtown tours, but they're the ones I've learned from. Um, and they're, they, they're encyclopedic about their knowledge of downtown buildings. And so I thought I'd just highlight a few of the stops. We do have, Traverse Area Historical Society has a um, virtual tour available on our website. That's traversehistory.org. And so um, we will be running a tour monthly downtown this summer. Uh, but you also can always check that out and kind of walk around on your own. Um, and then we will get more in depth with some of those things if you take it to her in person. Um, so, Jenny, I wanted to say that if yeah. you want me to, I did pull up um, the website from the Historical Society so I could show some of those pictures if you're not able to do it because of computer Yeah, I just wonder if it's going to overload it. Um, either way, I don't, I don't, I don't really care. So. Okay. I'll let me see if I can, are, are you done talking? I didn't mean no, to. Oh yeah. Nope. Switching okay. gears. Still looking for questions. We're good. Okay. So no questions about Dr. Rosenthal. Okay. Let's see if I can share. Looks like I can. So can you see my screen? The pictures aren't perfect, but they'll get us there. Mm -hmm. So uh, what I'm gonna, Jenny had this a little better organized when we thought we were using her computer, but I'll, I'll wing it here. Uh, when we do the downtown tour, we don't get all the way down to the Bayfront, but we usually stop on the corner of Union and Front Street. And, and look, or Union and Cass and Union in front, and look down at the bay from there. And this, as it says, is a waterfront view from the 1870s. It's looking west, basically where uh, Grand Traverse, where the parkway runs now, more or less. It, obviously it was a railroad track at that point. So Traverse City is on your left. Um, the mouth of the river, is 
in this picture further east than it would be today when Grandview Parkway was built. The, the mouth of the river was actually shifted to the west. So where you see the river coming out there is sort of like where the west parking lot of the Holiday Inn is today. And as you can see, totally industrial, as was the north end of Boardman Lake uh, up in, into the 20th century. So we tell the story of how that transformed and who transformed it and why it was transformed. Um, we were talking about Perry Hanna, and this is the Hanna Sawmill. We don't walk right by this spot, but you can see it from Front Street looking down. And this, can you see that my arrow moving on here? Mm -hmm. Okay, this, this tower here that's sort of obscured by smoke was at, it was a sawdust burner, if I got that right, Larry? Shaking yes. my chest. Okay, thank you. It was a sawdust burner for the mills and it was right at the north end of Cass Street is where it basically where it sat. And this is the Hannah Lane Mill. Uh, the Boardman River is right in front of us there. So we're looking northeast in this picture. And this is more or less where those new condominiums were just built on the north side of Boardman River with Union Street, Street running on the far side of the pictures, or maybe it's in the middle of the picture. So obviously we have changed significantly. Um, I want, I'm want i skipping through some of the things. We obviously, we talk about the Opera House and the Bohemian families that were behind that. When we do the tour downtown, we do talk about a lot of the architecture. So this is the Greenhouse Cafe that has, we, I think it is original sort of art deco looking uh, front to it. Here's a connection to Perry Hanna. The Fifth Third Bank started out as the Traverse City State Bank in 1904 early 1900s, the bank actually started in the mercantile building. So the Hanalei Mercantile Building is on the northeast corner of Front and Union being turned into condos. That sounds like I'm repeating myself a lot about <laughs> condominiums in Traverse City. Um, and the bank, Traverse City State Bank, started out by Perry Hanna as a bank to handle the finances of the Hanna and Lay Company. And then in night, so it was within the mercantile building. Then in 1904, the Fifth Third Bank was built in 1904. And then through that, I joke that you can sort of tell when people move to Traverse City or if they were born here by what they think of the name of this bank being. It was Pace Center in the 70s, I believe. And then it, it became Fifth Third, and it seems like I'm missing one. There, I think there's Old Kent. Old Kent. Oh, Old Kent. Kent. Oh my gosh, that's I what started, it was. I started started Old Kent. Yeah, yeah. So you could. So it went Traverse City State Bank, Pace Center, Old Kent, Fifth Third, um, and there. And the tower has been changed on that. The clock tower. Um, I'm not sure. Yeah, it's a little bit different in this picture. They had a fire up there. Oh, is that why they changed it? Yeah. Ah, I see, I've learned something today. Great, I can add that onto the tour when I do it. Uh, more things we talk about is why the building on the corner of, this is the Southwest corner of Union and Front, why it's now two stories instead of five stories. Same building, but it, doesn't look the same. And of course, here's the Hanalei Mercantile. And I think this is a great comparison of how the building, you know, you can still tell it's the same building, but it does look very different. And I love the picture on the top because you can see the wooden sidewalks. The street is still mud, which is one way we can date photographs because we know what year this part of Front Street was paved. I believe it was 1902. So if the street isn't paved yet, we know, we might know for other reasons too, but we know for sure it's gotta be before 1902 or else the street would be paved, yes? Yeah, you know how technically I am, so. Yes, am I a year I, off? I'm, 
I would just point out it's not quite the same building. The top one is the original six bays, whereas the bottom one is after the 1941 fire where they lost the eastern two bays. And so it's not quite as long. And right. uh, interesting it's fact about that with the fire in the, uh, in the uh, uh, bank building tower, there has been a fire in every building on that, those four corners. Interesting. And I, in my own defense, I will say I was going to point that out, but Larry beat me to it. <laughs> Sorry. But no, that's okay. I might have forgotten. Believe me. I, it's like, you know, I, I'm more concerned about dates sometimes and I might be a year or two off, but I had never thought about that. You're absolutely right. Every single building on that corner has had a fire in it. Um, mm -hmm. The Masonic building was 87, I believe. And yep. yeah. So I remember that day because we saw it. I had just had a baby and I could see it from the balcony of our apartment. <laughs> um, we talk about cigar factories in Traverse City. The, there used to be one above uh, the Weaver building here. And I don't want to tell you everything, the history of the post office where it was originally, where it is now, a mystery about this post office. I'd love to have someone be able to answer mm -hmm. and uh, just what it looked like. This is Union Street looking south. So from Union looking across the Boardman River, it looks like you're in the middle of the wilderness, which they were <laughs> at the time. And this is the Hannon Lee Grist Mill, which sat where the fish pass is proposed to go. So we go into the history of, you know, when the mill was there, why it isn't there anymore. And uh, Jenny, am I, I'm just sort of flipping through here. Yeah, you're going, no, you're going through great. And I think that's a good highlight too. Oh, the okay. fire, yeah. And here, uh, now that as I'm showing these pictures, I realized we could call it the fire tour of Traverse City because a lot of the, there have been, a lot of fires in downtown Traverse City. The whole, we talk about the whole story of the whole southwest corner of park and front burnt down in the late 1800s. Um, and of course, this is, a, this is the firehouse, the first brick firehouse in Traverse City. It's on Cass Street. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, on the history, I'm just going slowly. I don't want to give mm -hmm. people motion sickness here. And then depending on the length of the tour, the, the tour runs a good hour and a half. And depending on how much people talk, it can stretch to two hours. Um, I think most of you probably know that we have the longest continually operating synagogue mm -hmm. in Michigan is in Traverse City. It's tucked in behind the Griffin Law Building. What is the name of that building now? Um, on no. Street. Robert P. Griffin. Uh, Isn't it the Hall of Justice or the? Justice. Yeah, it could be the Hall of Justice. It's, it's tucked in behind there. Uh, other tidbits, we tell things like uh, Park Street used to go all the way through to the river. So where you drive underneath the addition or the wing to the park place now, that street used to go all the way through and there were houses and businesses on either side of it. And that was pretty recent. I know there are people on the, even if I had lived here, I would remember when Park Street went all the way through. And the courthouse, something the Historical Society was very uh, connected to in saving that building when it was going to be torn down in the, was that the 70s also, Larry? Which building? Uh, the courthouse, the Grand Traverse Courthouse. When were they gonna tear that down? I I'm wanna sorry. say it was the 19th. I don't call that offhand. I don't remember. And, uh, Oh, we'll end with this, another Perry Hanna connection. Uh, the Park Place Hotel was originally the Campbell House. Uh, and it's really interesting to go on the tours and find out how the person who turned it from the Campbell House into 
the Park Place. It actually became the Park Place quite early, but the transition from the wooden Campbell House to the brick Park Place took place in 1929. So those of you that know your history know what else happened that year nationally and worldwide. And we tell the story of how the Park Place brand new huge brick building managed to survive despite the fact, fact that it opened up during the Great Depression. So Jenny, I don't know how you want to round that up after that, if there's right. Well, um, yep, I do. Someone, um, Mary commented that she knows the daughter of an early postmaster and she asked what the mystery was about the <laughs> No, it's okay. I, I, what do you think, Jenny? Tell, tell, you can tell them the kind of things that you learn when you go on these tours. Uh, when the in the build the the post office on Union Street was built in 1930, I believe it was nine. I'm waiting for Larry because I know if I'm a year off, he'll let me know. 38, 39, and. Yes. At, thank you. And at some point, I want him to correct me if I'm wrong, by the way. Um, at some point, it was renovated, I believe, in the 1960s. And when it was originally built in 1939, there were wooden carving relief panels on the inside. The ceiling used to go up higher than it does now. If you go into the, into the post office now, they have those drop ceilings. Um, and the ceilings used to be much higher and above where the windows are, there were these really cool carved wooden reliefs, I believe of like maybe agricultural workers. And no one knows where they went uh, when the renovations were done. So, you know, whether they were shipped off to some great big cavernous United States storage unit like from Raiders of the Lost Ark, or rather one of the work, whether one of the workmen decided to haul them off somewhere. But if anyone ever sees fairly large wooden release like that in someone's men's den or woman's den around Traverse City, we'd love to get pictures of them. We don't want to arrest anybody. We just want to know. I was going to say, we're not calling people. Well, we might have. No, no, no. We just <laughs> want to know. I don't know if we have any photographs. Larry, have you ever actually seen pictures of them? I heard them refer, referred to as uh, murals, um, and I don't recall seeing any of, of what was in this post office. Yeah, I don't either. So that's the mystery. We don't know where they go. Another mystery we touch on very briefly is, was Al Capone really in Traverse City? Something that you get answers all over the board. That's funny about the murals because we just had a question at the library maybe two weeks ago where someone was asking about them and said, you know, well, you should know, you know, give me the information. And half of us hadn't even heard of it. And then what we were able to find was more like they were on loan and they went around to different post offices, it sounded like, but we didn't know if it was exactly the same ones. Oh, well, that's interesting. Um, that, it, it was, and I passed it on to Catherine, so I don't know if she found out any more information, but she told her at least what she knew about post office history. So that's right. interesting you brought that up. I wonder if this is Helen Altman. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm, I wonder if, if they were murals, if by any chance they could have been painted by Ezra Winter, who was a Traverse City native who went on to great, great fame as a mural painter. He studied in Rome at the American Academy in Rome. And I think he graduated high school around 1905, somewhere right. 1902, 35, anyway. And his murals are in Radio City Music Hall. They're in one of the buildings of the Library of Congress of Canterbury Tales and uh, Anyway, but he is Ezra Winter. I think he was born in 1849. And is it winter like a season, like winter, yeah, summer, fall? Yeah, like the season. Okay, great. Because if I had known that, I had forgotten it. And that would be a great article <laughs> yeah, to write about. It right? is. And, uh, he was, and he was, I think... Oh, no, go ahead. Oh, I... I finish what you were saying. Uh, no, I'm I just, I don't know. I don't know the year he died, 
but he was highly okay. esteemed. I mean, obviously, and I've seen the murals, of course, at Radio City Music Hall. They're huge. They're huge. They go up the grand stairs of the garden or the paradise and at the Library of Congress. They're on the fifth floor and of one of the Adams building. And they are all around the whole uh, uh, freeze of that, of the huge room that they're in. And they, they portray the Can Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. Yeah, I think, and I all I don't know that I've ever seen anything in writing. Everything I've heard about this is hearsay. And so you always sort of have to, I mean, you take it with a grain of salt, but if you hear it enough and it's close enough and it, you know, it sounds like there was something there, I think it was Wooden Reliefs and Betsy, what you say would make a logical sense if they were something that went around from place to place to place, maybe they weren't even there when the renovations were done. They may have moved on, but people remember right. seeing them because right. they were in there. Right, and enough so that maybe they're not. calling us and asking. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, anything else? Nope. Well, I, I could I could add one more thing about the post office, but it is not to our to our family's honor, and that is <laughs> <laughs> that that. But I won't give my maiden name nor my. I mean, I have I have. A, you know, dozens of people in Oakwood Cemetery. But my uncle was the postmaster, oh, in the mid to late 40s. And, I, well, I, sh I really shouldn't say this, but may he rest in peace. And I, I truly hope he does. But he embezzled from the post office. <laughs> and of course, oh, no. ended that, you know, his highly respected position there. I mean, he was not sent, he was not sent, he paid it back, he was not sent away or anything, but um, it was only whispered in between, you know, my mother and, you know, among, among we close family members. But I don't know any, I don't know anything about the mystery, so I still, I have to take the tour. <laughs> Well, I know Helen has a career in archives, so I'm sure she's run into this, but it's like whenever I tell anybody that's researching family history, just be careful what you might find out. Exactly. I mean, it's a wonderful thing to do, but, you know, we all start out thinking, oh, we're going to find out we're related to a queen or a king or a princess, or, and sometimes it ends up being a gangster or whatever. So. Whatever. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anyone else with questions? That made me think, so my, my personal interest in local history um, has to do with the Clinch Park Zoo area. Um, and it, one of these things that I need to research as I'm putting together more stuff about the zoo is every, there, there are a lot of people that are sure that there was a moose there, but there is no evidence that there was ever actually a moose. And so like the little things that you hear about and you like want to get down to the bottom of, there were elk, but there's like no photos of a moose and they're very hard to keep in captivity. So that's one I want to know about. Perhaps when someone saw some moose down there, it was the local order of moose that were meeting there. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and then I have, there was definitely a moose. I gotta, I gotta get, get this all compiled here. Um, so, um, 1940s, that helps me though. I actually have a lot of the old zoo records and you know, what animals were there and when, and all of this, hoping to do something about this, but it's the crowdsourcing where you get some of these stories. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I, I'll just add in there, my, my kids laugh at me because I, I'm an only child and I have very few cousins. And if I live long enough, eventually I will be the only source of oral history on my branch of the family. And whatever I say will be the best they can get. <laughs> Not that I would lie on purpose, but you know, it, uh, oral histories are incredibly important. But you all, if you're using them for definite, his, you know, for serious historical research, you always want to try and back them up with a secondary source or something. Because even, I mean, I'm in my 60s and my husband and I'll be like, you know, remember that trip we took with the kids in 1994? And I'll be like, well, it was in July and he'll be, no, it was in November. 
<laughs> no, I'm sure it was July. <laughs> and that was only 30 years ago. So yeah. Get yeah. more photographs. Well, that's great. Anything you'd like to add, Peg or Larry? I will tell everyone the dates of the tours that we have. We'll have that up on our website again, traversehistory.org. Um, we're going to do the downtown tours the last Saturday of every month, June through September. And we are going to do those at 10 in the morning. So hopefully it's not super warm. Uh, that would be June 26th, July 24th, August 28th, and September 25th. And then for our Oakwood Cemetery tours, that will be twice a month, um, the second and the fourth Sunday of every month meeting at 4 p.m. And that's June through September. So we have June 13th, 27th, July 11th, 25th, August 8th, 22nd, and September 12th and the 26th. And then for those of you with a slight spookier side to you, uh, the tours for the Halloween we usually do like two of them the weekend before whenever Halloween actually hits, but we don't have the dates yet. Yeah, we'll have those up, but we're happy to be back um, doing some of this, presenting more. The presentation side of things has been tough in the last year, but it was great for everyone to just show up today. Really appreciate it. All right, I think with, um, oh, we did have the question, will we continue our Zoom programs? And I, I'm not sure if the board has decided what we're doing with, I know Tattle's not quite doing in-person programs, we used to do them there. Um, and so I know that we'll at least make sure everyone's aware of the ones we've done in the past. They're all recorded. So that's nice to always go back to and, and see what else we can do. I, I, I think the last, it, it, having them come back in person will depend upon Tattle. And we have not talked to Betsy or Tattle about this, so I don't know how it would work, but I know we discussed at the last meeting the possibility of seeing if you can do in person and Zoom sort of at the same time so that people that want to come in in person, and it's not because of COVID, it's not like thinking people would be afraid to come in. It's just sometimes time-wise or depending where you are physically, it might just be easier to jump in on Zoom than to actually come in in person. But those decisions haven't been made. And of course, that would also depend upon Tattle and what it's often. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And we haven't talked about it yet. Um, it's so new. If it did, it would be after June. Um, and then we have to think about how we can do the Zoom and regular programming at the same time. There's a way, but our technology guys have to figure it all out for us. Exactly. Yeah, so we'll keep everyone posted. It has been nice to do these programs online. I think it has brought different people in and I've enjoyed it. So we appreciate it. Um, everyone enjoy your Saturday um, and we'll see you soon. Okay. Thank you everyone on this gorgeous day. We still have time. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> See you soon. Sounds yep. good.